Uh, for today's session, uh, and really for, for both sessions today, we're digging into uh, an exciting and new addition to our toolbox in the response to HIV, and that is HIV self-testing. Uh, HIV self-testing, first recommended by the World Health Organization in 2016 as an additional approach to complement existing HIV testing services uh, in jurisdictions really around the world. Um, Canada uh, first licensed a HIV self-test, that's the INSTE self-test, back in November of 2020. It was surprising to me, I realized it was actually licensed uh, during the, the current COVID-19 pandemic. Of course, we know there were disruptions in the availability of HIV testing uh, in Ontario and across the country. And so self-testing really comes at an important time in our uh, response to HIV. Lots of evidence supporting the acceptability of HIV self-testing among certain key populations, including gay and bisexual men and trans women. And it's especially important to reach individuals who experience uh, systemic barriers to accessing the healthcare system. For this morning's session, uh, I'm really happy to introduce uh, three speakers who are leading the way on different HIV self-testing implementation projects that are both provincial and national in scope. First, we're going to hear from Rick Galley. Rick's the Director of Testing and Clinical Trials Implementation with REACH Nexus, that project uh, you would know as I Am Ready. Next, we'll turn things over to Patrick O'Byrne. Patrick's a professor at the University of Ottawa and lead uh, along uh, uh, with the OHTN on Get a Kit, which many of your organizations are actively uh, participating in and rolling out across the province. And then finally, last but not least, we'll hear from Chris Dranos, who's the National STDBI Testing and Linkage Implementation Manager uh, and a registered nurse, works closely with uh, CBRC uh, and uh, on their HIV self-testing project nationally. So each speaker is gonna have 25 minutes. I encourage folks to use the chat function uh, throughout to drop comments, drop questions. There will be time at the end to uh, come back to those. Uh, and this session is also being recorded and will be made available to view uh, after. Uh, so without further ado, I will turn things over to Rick Daly. Thank you. Thanks very much, Dane. I am going to uh, lead things off. I'm going to start by sharing my screen here. Bear with me a moment. Great, so thanks very much and good morning everyone and thank you for joining this session. Uh, I think you'll find there's going to be a lot of interesting information provided. And as Dane said, uh, my name is Rick Galley and I uh, work with uh, Sean Work and, and our team at uh, Reach Nexus at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto. And uh, today I'm giving this uh, presentation of our work entitled, I'm Ready implementing a national HIV self-testing research program in Canada to reach the undiagnosed and connect them to care. And shown here on this opening slide are our community partner organizations, uh, which is the uh, Community-Based Research Center or CBRC, Women's Health and Women's Hands here in Toronto, and the SHABAC, the Canadian HIV AIDS Black African and Caribbean Network, as well as our funders, the CIHR, CANFAR, and the Public Health Agency of Canada. So before we get into the I'm Ready program elements themselves, and uh, I'll share with you the results of the first three months of the program, I wanted to share some earlier material that led to the development of the I'm Ready program. Back in 2020, at the peak of the COVID pandemic impact, we conducted a survey of community health workers about their perspectives on the value of having a self-test available for use and on the impact that COVID-19 was having on their, uh, their practices. And shown here are some of the results of that survey. There was a strong support for having mobile and online technology for HIV self-testing and linkage to care. There was strong support for community readiness 
and having access to HIV self-testing. And COVID-19 did have a very profound negative effect on access to HIV and STDBI testing overall, and on overall health services at the participating community health organizations. And shown in the table here on the right, HIV testing and counseling, STDBI testing, PrEP services, HIV medications, mental health services, and harm reduction all were significantly negatively impacted because of COVID. We also knew that Canada was ready for new approaches to HIV testing. We all know that HIV is not a death sentence. Today, people can live long and healthy lives if they know their status and can get medical care. Medication can also make someone's viral load undetectable, at which point they can't transmit HIV to anyone else, which as we know is the foundation of U equals U or undetectable equals untransmissible. And yet there's large gaps that remain. Unlike other G7 countries, Canada is not seeing a reduction in the overall number of new people being diagnosed with HIV. And in fact, transmission is increasing in Canada by upwards of 25% between 2014 and 2018, and that trend is still continuing today. An estimated 8,000 of the 68,000 people in Canada living with HIV don't know they have it. And testing options available to date have not met everyone's needs. So really to help meet these unmet needs, it was felt that HIV self-testing is the missing link to help end the HIV epidemic in Canada. Self-testing does break down barriers and gives people the choice to know their status and on their own terms. And for those of you who may not be familiar with the INSTI-HIV self-test itself, here's a few facts. The test was approved, as, as Dane mentioned in the intro, uh, approved by Health Canada on November 3rd. And that represents the first HIV self-test approved in Canada. The Canadian manufacturer, which is Biolytical Laboratories, is located in Richmond, British Columbia. The test itself is very safe and simple to use. It has over 99% accuracy for detection of HIV-1 and HIV-2 antibodies. It's a finger prick test, so it involves a single drop of blood. And everything you need to do the test is provided in the, in the package, which includes three reagent vials, a lancet, a small test device, uh, a Band-Aid for after the finger stick, and then of course the instructions for use. And the test is discreet, it's confidential, and someone can take the test when and where they want to. And it's also very fast. The results show in as little as one minute where a single dot, a control dot shows the results are valid and a second dot means that a positive or reactive test result has been obtained. So the stage was set for the I'm Ready program to follow a rapid uh, development and implementation pathway following the approval uh, back in November. So these next um, um, several slides will give you some background on the program and also uh, on the results of the first three months of I'm Ready following the implementation. To reach an estimated 8,000 individuals living with HIV in Canada who remain undiagnosed, Reach Nexus implemented the I'm Ready Research Program in June of this year, just seven months after the first HIV self-test was licensed in Canada. I'm Ready is an integrated program utilizing technology systems that include a mobile app to access free HIV self-tests, a comprehensive website with details on resources, information and care pathways, and a virtual telehealth platform staffed by trained peer navigators who can provide support. All 18 Canadians, or all Canadians 18 years of age and older are eligible for enrollment. And shown here on the, in, in the quote is a, a general philosophy uh, around the I'm Ready program. And I'll read it for you here, I'm ready to lay my fear to rest. I'm ready to device, defy stigma. 
I'm ready to seek advice. I'm ready to know my status. I'm ready to love and be loved. So through the I'm Ready Test mobile app, participants will create an anonymous profile, answer surveys, order up to three free HIV self-tests for delivery or pickup at community sites, take the test and provide results. And this app can be downloaded from the Apple or Google uh, sites, and it's, of course, free of charge. Participants have the opportunities to connect directly to peer navigators for support before, during, or after taking the test through the integrated I'm Ready Talk platform. And participants can use the self-test kits to test themselves, or they can provide the kits to others within their social network and encourage them to join the I'm Ready program. And studies have shown that this concept of what's called secondary distribution through these social networks has been very effective in reaching the undiagnosed. So who have we reached in the first three months of the I'm Ready program? A total of 1,311 people consented and participated in the pre-test survey through the I'm Ready test app. The mean age was 33 years old and 46% of the participants were under 30 years of age. Participants from key populations included 630 gay or bisexual men having sex with men, 136 individuals from African, Caribbean and black communities, 61 indigenous First Nations and Métis peoples, and 38 people who inject drugs. Regarding sexual identity, 38% identified as gay, 28% straight, 13% bisexual, 5% queer, and 16% as either heteroflexible, pansexual, questioning, or preferred not to answer. 75% of the participants are from large urban centers with populations greater than 100,000, 14% from medium-sized cities of between 30 and 100,000, and 11% came from small rural centers with populations less than 30,000. And here we can see, um, if you look on the left graph, that in the first three months, 60% of all participants who responded to the surveys identified with at least one of the key populations. Nearly half of those identified as GBMSM with much lower percentages identifying as ACB, indigenous, or persons who inject drugs, which really points to the need for uh, some more focused efforts in reaching uh, some of these key populations. And on the graph on the right, we can see that I'm Ready participants have come from all provinces and territories across Canada with the majority or nearly 80% coming from Ontario, Quebec, and British Columbia. This also points to the need for some more regionally focused efforts to scale up enrollment. For example, shown here, the province of Saskatchewan saw only 13 participants in the first three months, which is less than any of the Atlantic provinces, including PEI. So some key findings are shown here. In the first three months, there was a total of uh, 2,705 HIV self-test kits distributed in every, in every province and territory in Canada, which worked out to an average of about two tests per participant. 61% of these kits were delivered by mail to a home address, and 39% were picked up at one of 80 community location or community partner locations across the country. And the map here shows the kit distribution of the first uh, 1,778 kits uh, across Canada in the first three months. Of note, 25% of all the participants were first time testers for HIV, including 33% of those less than 30 years of age. So in reality, one in three participants under 30 years old was a first time tester for HIV. 
Surprisingly, access to peer navigators has been quite low with only about uh, just less than 50, I think 46 appointments um, being scheduled in the first three months. And to date, three people have been reached who were undiagnosed with HIV. And all three were from key populations, including one who was a first time tester. And just recently, a fourth new positive self tester entered their result um, through the app. So we are reaching the undiagnosed. The readytoknow.ca website provides instructions on how to pick up a self-test kit, what to expect when you go to pick up a kit at a pickup site, and the locations themselves of the uh, self-test pickup sites are searchable so that you can find a convenient location. And this is regularly updated as new sites come on board. I wanted to touch uh, a, a little bit on the Peer Navigator telehealth platform of the I'm Ready program, which has been surprisingly underutilized. Shown here are some of the features that we thought might draw participants to seek out support from our peer navigators, uh, who've all been onboarded through our community partners, CBRC and Women's Health and Women's Hands. And these features include things like our peer navigators are there to support service users before, during, or after they take the test seven days a week. The telehealth platform is staffed by informed, trained peer navigators with lived experiences. And through the platform itself, self-testers can choose a peer that they would be comfortable talking to according to their own comfort levels and based on how the peer navigators describe themselves. Yet despite having a team of accessible, well-prepared and truly representative peer navigators on hand every day, there's obviously some barriers that are preventing folks from accessing this service. And we need to better understand what those barriers might be. We're currently working with the peers themselves in um, perhaps trying to find ideas on how to better encourage folks to connect to the I'm Ready Talk platform and use the services of these peer navigators, all of whom are extremely eager to help. So I'm just gonna conclude the I'm Ready portion of this talk uh, before uh, introducing you to some of the uh, new elements that we're working on uh, with uh, lots of enthusiasm here. So the initial results from I'm Ready are promising and show that the use of technology, such as a mobile app and virtual telehealth platform, combined with low barrier access to HIV self-testing is effective for reaching the undiagnosed who are living with HIV and also encouraging first-time testers to access HIV self-testing. We're now taking steps to significantly scale up the I'm Ready program with the goal of ensuring health equity and access to testing and connections to care for all key populations across the country. And I invite you to learn more at the readytoknow.ca website. So in these last two slides, I want to um, introduce you to some of the additional programs that Reach Nexus is leading that are about scaling up efforts in reaching the undiagnosed and also linking to care and on bringing new tests to the Canadian market. Shown here is an exciting project involving the use of interactive dispensing systems that look very much like vending machines with a four foot iPhone fixed to the front. Now, recognizing that the I'm Ready program may not be able to reach all populations in Canada, and in particular, those who do not have access to a smartphone, Reach Nexus is working in partnership with community agencies across Canada, along with some government agencies and the folks at Smart One Health Solutions in British Columbia, with funding from CIHR and CANFAR to establish a network of interactive dispensing systems that will provide low barrier access to harm reduction materials, as well as HIV self-tests. And this is very much a work in progress and some highlights are shown here. We hope to have up to a hundred of these IDS units across Canada over the next three years. 
First sites are in British Columbia, or I'm sorry, in New Brunswick, with partnership uh, with the Ensemble Community Health Center in Moncton, where there are already dispensing harm reduction materials with two of these units. And we hope to be adding self-tests kits into these units um, by the end of this year or in January of next year. And each of these IDS units provides easy 24 seven user access through coded identifiers unique to each user, uh, such as a color plus an avatar plus a unique ID number. So an example would be a purple unicorn 24689, something like that. Anonymous interaction data collection is gathered directly at each unit using the touch screen display through a short, simple survey. Automated test kit and material dispensing and tracking for inventory controls is, 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 um, is available. And the data flow architecture is still being mapped out, but will involve a centralized um, uh, data portal that can be accessed by Reach Nexus. And each agency would also have access to their specific IDS unit data. So this project is very much underway in the early stages, and uh, there'll be a lot of uh, exciting updates um, forthcoming. And finally, this last slide shows some of the active projects that are focused on bringing new tests to market in Canada. REACH is conducting sequential multi-site clinical trials of two HIV testing products from the US-based Orisher Technologies Company. And the first study, which is underway now, is a healthcare provider study designed to assess the performance of the Oroquick Advance rapid HIV test in point of care settings performed by untrained healthcare workers in both oral fluid and finger stick blood. And it's listed here in the clinicaltrials.gov website where most uh, such clinical trials are listed. So there's some details on how that study is being conducted. And it's currently underway in two of the four sites, including Women's Health and Women's Hands in Toronto and Clinic Actuelle in Montreal, with the other two sites starting shortly. And this study is a precursor to the next study shown here, which is the uh, Oroquick HIV self-test study on oral fluid samples that are collected, tested, and interpreted by intended users. And data from both of these studies is going to be submitted by the manufacturer to support license applications for both the point of care test and the self-test, the oral fluid self-test, hopefully leading to there being a second license HIV point of care test, and importantly, a second licensed HIV self-test in Canada that will offer individuals choices before the end of, of, of next year. And next up is uh, what's called the POSH study, which stands for Point of Care for HIV and Syphilis. And it's led by Dr. Amita Singh at the University of Alberta with support from REACH. It is now past the midway point of enrollment with over 800 subjects from Northern Alberta now enrolled. And the study is looking at the performance of two investigational rapid test devices that test for HIV and syphilis simultaneously allowing for immediate treatment intervention for syphilis and on the spot linkage pathways for HIV positives. And to date, they've identified eight individuals who are living with HIV but had not been diagnosed and upwards of 150 cases of active syphilis, including some in pregnant women, which are really pretty staggering numbers and point to the urgent need to have these types of multiplex point of care devices approved in Canada for clinical application as soon as possible. This study hopes to wrap up by the end of this year and we'll be working on providing the data to the manufacturers to support license applications shortly thereafter. So we can hopefully see these tests approved sometime as early as mid 2022. And lastly, um, Stuart Skinner and his team in Saskatchewan with support from REACH are following the lead set by Amy Singh with their own study designed to reach the undiagnosed living with HIV and syphilis or syphilis. The difference here is that they'll be conducting the licensed HIV point of care test, that's the INSTI test, as well as the investigational reveal rapid uh, T pallidum test for syphilis antibodies produced by MedMira. So no multiplex testing. 
Saskatchewan is currently in the midst of a horrendous outbreak of infectious syphilis. Preliminary data from their Ministry of Health indicates there were 902 confirmed cases of infectious syphilis in 2020, which is nearly tenfold increase from 2018. And an estimated additional 527 cases have been detected this year, with many more to be added as investigations are completed. And the province has recorded 10 confirmed cases of babies acquiring syphilis in the womb, and two babies were born, stillborn as a result. So needless to say, the availabil availability of a license point of care test device for syphilis will help to reach these populations that have been difficult to reach through other intervention pathways. And data from this study, again, will be provided to Health Canada for subsequent license of the rapid syphilis test, hopefully um, late next year or early in 2023. So I'm gonna stop here and thank you all very much for your attention and look forward to the discussion at the end of the session. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over. Thanks so much, uh, Rick. I feel like I uh, barely had to play timekeeper. That was uh, perfect, thanks so much. Uh, we're gonna turn things over now to Patrick O'Byrne uh, from the University of Ottawa to share more on Get a Kit. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks, Dan. Uh, I'm going to do the same struggle that uh, Rick just had on sharing my screen. That visible the my presenter slide or just the single slides? Uh, just single slides. Looks Excellent. great. Thank you. Um, so uh, thanks for inviting me um, to present on Getikit. Uh, it blends exceptionally well with what Rick was just uh, presenting on and um, the integration between I'm Ready and Rick and Sean and what we're doing, uh, having met before. And Rick and I, I think I've met a few more times uh, subsequently. Uh, it's just nice to have us together sort of presenting, letting people uh, see everything. So um, getting into this, uh, funding is from the Ontario HIV uh, Treatment Network. This is a provincial project, uh, acknowledging of the actual clinical team that I work with um, and my research chair that I have. Conflicts of interest, um, we have none to declare. So get a kit as the overview. Uh, location is Ontario plus the National Capital Region, and this will expand uh, across through everything that falls within uh, the NCA. The National Capital Area is actually uh, interprovincial, so it's going to be anything that falls within that plus Ontario. Uh, our focus is on uh, anybody who is disproportionately affected by STIs or HIV. Uh, and our method is really it's an assessment uh, of automated clinical assessments, uh, taking what I do as a licensed nurse practitioner and the acting medical director for the sexual health clinic in Ottawa and saying, is it possible to take sort of everything that's in my head and actually automate it to allow people to go through this process? Uh, so it's not necessarily um, a research study in that we're just collecting survey data on a variety of different things. It's really taking the exact guidelines from the Public Health Agency of Canada, from Public Health Ontario, uh, from the United States Centers for Disease Control and saying, can we actually turn this into a, an automated uh, clinical system that not just follows the algorithm, that actually learns from people's input, uh, memorizing, getting faster and actually uh, becoming slightly adaptive. Uh, our delivery is in person. Uh, people can do curbside, they can order on site, they can do in person paper based registration. Um, the automated online system is also available. Uh, whether through a computer or a smartphone or a, a tablet. So that's a quick overview sort of how ours looks. So the background is basically the same. Uh, what Rick has gone through, despite best efforts, we have uh, brought down, but not incredibly, the number of people who uh, remain undiagnosed with HIV. We are seeing very minimal uh, changes whatsoever across Ontario in the actual rates. Um, in fact, all decreases in HIV transmission uh, that we've seen across Ontario are attributable exclusively to Ottawa and sort of the aggressive uh, PEP and PrEP uh, and treatment as prevention programs that we have been running locally. Uh, so again, we're sitting status quo and this is this is not a criticism of what we've done. It's just saying what we've done has taken us so far. And I mean, as Rick aptly put, this is the next tool that we think we should add in uh, to really help us move forward, right? This is what we're looking for. Is this a new tool in the toolbox that's actually going to help us 
theoretically, um, we're saying, yes, this is definitely the case. Um, as we're rolling it out, we're learning more about it. Uh, we have identified undiagnosed infections. Rick just said the same thing. So in fact, right, this is becoming um, something that's useful and we're showing its actual sort of utility in the real world beyond clinical settings and beyond sort of us theorizing about what the impact could or may be. Uh, also built into Getikit is a full STI screener, so the automation and the actual uh, sort of learning logic that we have uh, acknowledges and accepts that different groups are disproportionately affected by different infections, uh, and so recommendations are made through the system, uh, moving toward actual full inclusion of it. Uh, what we're looking at here is basically when we, jumping to the next one, when we use NAT testing um, for, so extra genital testing, oral swabs, rectal swabs, uh, urine testing for men who have sex with men, uh, we find that around 70% of gonorrhea infections are actually not genital whatsoever, meaning that the individual who goes in and just does a urine test for every three infections we would identify across uh, Ontario, we would miss seven. Uh, and this becomes a major limitation when you have online prep clinics that are not offering a full comprehensive sort of wraparound STI testing, uh, limiting to just the genital testing. Most of the infections remain undiagnosed, they pass around uh, and you just end up with it. The individual as well may have a false sense of reassurance that they did do the testing and they don't have any infections when in fact they do. Uh, and so Getikit has the ability to make these recommendations, provide them to patients and practitioners uh, built into actual operating clinics currently, uh, and also moving toward um, sort of beyond the mail out delivery of all of this as well. Um, it is also built on a regional specific epidemiology, so it has the ability in its back end to actually tailor based on the local uh, prevalence incidence data for new infections, saying that we know uh, the new diagnoses among new immigrants in Toronto is different from what we're seeing in London, where we were seeing huge outbreaks among people who were uh, sharing injection and drug equipment. And so we're actually able to tailor down to forward sortation areas to say this is the most affected group uh, within any geographical area. And this is actually tailored for all of the partner sites who are on the uh, call with us right now. This is tailored for everyone who is a current participant based on the actual local data that Public Health Ontario has to make sure that everything is being recommended based on what's occurring. Um, this, I think, is probably an artifact of me being in uh, Ottawa for right, all of my work and long having had uh, things from Toronto just imposed on me, saying Toronto is the one single unified model that we all must follow. And I was like, this is interesting and great, and it works in Toronto, but it's not necessarily the model that we're going to have elsewhere in the province. Uh, there is no other city right in Canada that has 4.5 million people in it. So it's how do we actually make it for the vast majority of Canadian cities? Uh, which are small to medium sized. So we really worked on that kind of model. It's also built on, and it's just with the background, this is what we call express testing that we've been running in uh, Ottawa since 2013. And we actually had a paper-based uh, system that really went through and said, do you need to see a clinician, yes or no? And if you need to see a clinician, would this be a registered nurse or does this need, would this be a physician or a nurse practitioner? Uh, those who qualified for express were basically rapidly screened through offered testing um, and right offered sort of a quick appointment. Um, we found that this increased clinic capacity. So get a kit effectively is an automization uh, of what we've been running through the auto STI clinic uh, that I implemented back uh, about eight years ago. So it's just an evolution of all of this work coming together. Uh, the risk matrix we use is actually a two by two. Uh, you are low, medium, high, right? Low, medium, high in two different uh, axes. Along the x-axis, you have basically your risk of transmission. This is relatively simple and well understood uh, in that if you engage in X, Y, or Z practice, what's the chance that you could have transmission, right? If you're sharing needles, if you are bottoming, um, if you are performing oral sex, if you just went to the bathhouse because you really like watching people jerk off, right? It really depends on what your practice is. Uh, so we can really go from there's zero risk to there is a high risk uh, of transmission. What we really get caught up in infectious diseases, and this is COVID, this is HIV, this is everything, is, okay, what's the chance you were actually exposed, right? You went into an area and you didn't wear a mask. Uh, you went and had sex and you didn't use a condom, right? What's the chance that you put yourself into a situation where transmission could have occurred? Would it have occurred because the person that you had sex with, the person you came into contact with, the person you shared drugs with, whatever it happens to be, is serodiscordant? 
And so we map out to say that right, if you are a member of ACD population, African and Caribbean Black, you engaged in condomless vaginal sex, right, if the ACD population is a higher prevalence, so we move along the y-axis, which is the vertical one. Uh, the, on the condomless vaginal sexual contact is also a high risk, so we move along the x-axis, and we just plot the intercept to fall within the different categories. Um, and then it does a cutoff saying, well, you fall within this, this is what's recommended for you. And we really built this for PEP and PrEP. Uh, clinicians were constantly saying, I want a detailed list of everyone who needs it, but the, the number of possible situations where people could uh, need pepper prep is infinite. And so we had to come up with basically a rubric that guides uh, the clinical practice, less so in STI clinics and more so within the emergency rooms where people are less familiar uh, with this and less comfortable. Uh, and then we automated it. This is just sort of the actual uh, automation running, different calculations, different numbers, uh, figuring out if people actually qualify. So the implementation, we uh, rolled out July 20th, 2020. Uh, we applied and obtained special access from Health Canada to proceed with testing. Um, this was really to say, uh, we know that the test is under review. We know that HIV testing has dramatically decreased. Um, we would like to proceed with a special access request for Ottawa to actually test this and see what's coming. And so we implemented months before the test was actually approved to get us some data. This was pilot in Ottawa exclusively to say, okay, what do we, what are the hiccups? What are the issues? What are the barriers? How can we improve this? Uh, is it worth moving forward with? And if so, what would we change uh, as we scaled up uh, provincially and beyond? We now have the actual number, I think is somewhere around 15 to 17 subsites across uh, Ontario uh, with full coverage for every area in um, Ontario. The onboarding of subsequent sites started in the spring uh, of 2021. And so really, when I look at the numbers shortly, I'll show you phase one, which is Ottawa only, uh, but I'll, I'll tell you all the updated information that we have as well. So logging on, we have a very simple uh, website. People can go through. It's easy to figure out how to register, how to report your results, how to actually create an account. Um, and people can go in. These subsites are all identical in the background, but the front end are tailored and tweaked to local resources uh, by specific geography. And so what you have uh, in any given region. Once people order, as I said, they go through the actual self-assessment and you can see I, I completed this saying that I was a white gay man uh, who has uh, sex with men, separating sort of the practice and the orientation. Uh, I engaged in oral sex, anal sex, top bottom. Uh, and I said that I hadn't been tested um, within the last 12 months. And so the qualification for the HIV self-test is there. Uh, the quantity for guest kits uh, is also existing. Um, if need be, and that there's also the recommendation saying that an HIV test is important, absolutely, but that is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to actual sexual health testing. Uh, and here's a recommendation in this sheet. Um, you can screen capture as I did. Um, you can also download it uh, and having it printed to actually uh, the Get a Kit logo page uh, will be launched within the next couple of days. Is something to help people take to their primary care practitioner, whether they're a physician or nurse practitioner, to a walk-in clinic, to an SDI clinic. Uh, we long know that individuals struggle in negotiating with some of these centers and sites to say, I want these tests, uh, and people say no. And so our system actually becomes a way uh, marked on the letter letterhead and with full uh, details, contact information, and supporting uh, information to say, here's what you need. Let's help you actually get connected to full care uh, while we move into the full mail-out system. And you can see all the calculations uh, are in there correctly. The hep C uh, is also listed due to the fact that um, clinical guidelines will say once annual screening, if we have people high risk, uh, and this in this case, I have reported no testing uh, within the last 12 months. So the kit itself um, is, we actually took the INSTI kit and then we built sort of a package around it. I have one here. Um, I always like to show the size of it uh, besides my head. You can see that it's not super large. It does wash out a little bit in my camera. Uh, but the box itself just says hello, hello, right, is otherwise unmarked. Uh, and it opens up to provide a variety of different resources. Uh, I'm going to take the self test out before everything falls on the floor. Uh, but you can see sort of it falls out here. And on the screen, you can see included with this is information on HIV self testing, on linkage to care, on PEP, on PrEP. Um, cards to pass along to other people, condoms and lubricant all included. Uh, and we've actually, I mean, I didn't know what the uptake and feedback was going to be. Um, none of us did for the condoms and lube and gotten a surprising amount of feedback with people saying like, this is excellent, uh, glad for including this. 
uh, and we'll continue uh, to do so this. There's also a workstation. Um, the InstiKit uh, is exceptionally effective, but it can be cumbersome. Uh, having done thousands of these myself, having been involved in the Proud study where we had people uh, handing them out to peers uh, in Ottawa back in, I think this was 2013, we did that. Uh, we found it was complex for a lot of first time users. Uh, and so we built a workstation to actually help people get through this, right, to lay pieces out so they don't fall out, so they don't spill, so you can put them in order. Um, it is a great test, but it is cumbersome. Uh, and so that's really one of the things that we wanted to work on. The follow-up, there is a standard protocol. Uh, people are linked to care. Um, this goes through what uh, we call a status neutral approach. So anyone who reports uh, invalid results will be linked to reordering. Uh, anyone who has a negative result and is a member of the parity population is immediately offered uh, and linked in with local PEP and PREP uh, services. In Ottawa specifically, anyone will be booked within five to seven days uh, within our clinic if they respond saying they are interested. Uh, and we have direct members, emails, contact information to people follow up and actually do the booking. Uh, and they will be guaranteed a spot and it is within a week for us to do the onboarding and actually uh, intake and initiation. Uh, anyone who has a positive result is linked for confirmatory testing uh, local care. We have, um, I'll save it for the findings, which is uh, coming shortly, but I'll just go through the numbers there. So we have two publications on it, which are both open access and publicly available. Uh, one is within the Canadian Journal of Public Health. Uh, the second is within the Canadian Communicable Disease Report. Um, the Journal of Public Health is more on implementation and our initial uptake. The CCDR is going to be all of phase one. So this is going to be the Ottawa uh, data from July 20th through to the spring uh, of 2021, uh, overviewing exactly what we saw, uptake uh, outcomes, results, uh, linkages, uh, and so forth. So from the CCDR, there's a lot of information here, but you can see the people who identify as a member of the priority population is 71%. This number is actually wrong. Uh, it is much higher than that due to the fact that in designing the initial intake, our, our questions on um, sex work were not clearly identified. And consequently, people who were engaging in sex work who were doing HIV testing uh, were not captured in these data at that point. People were offered testing, but it means that our 71% is actually the most conservative estimate we could have. Uh, basically, around three quarters of people who we gave tests to fall within uh, the HIV priority populations, both designated by uh, the Ministry of Health in Ontario and the Public Health Agency of Canada. Uh, for age, you can see ethnicity. These were primarily people who were white. Um, or individuals who are Black, it was 6%. This exceeds the sort of population level in Ottawa, which is around 4%. Uh, but due to the elevated prevalence and sort of burden of infection among ACB populations, uh, I would like to see this number higher. And we have been actively recruiting and moving uh, that much, much higher. Gender most, most were cisgendered men, uh, due to the fact that uh, we had most people going who were GDMSM. Sexual orientation, you can see almost 60% identified as GDMSM, uh, income range listed there. Four, I never tested before. You can see this is over on the second table. Uh, we had around 27% report that they were never tested before. Interestingly, we actually came up with a markedly um, significant difference between those who identified in males and females, just stratifying into the two. Um, and it really came down to this number, went up to 50% when it came down to black women. Uh, so we were actually reaching almost one in two Black women who'd reported no prior HIV testing whatsoever, uh, whereas among the entire population, it was around 27%. There was an additional four and a half, I think it was 4.8%, uh, who also said uh, they were uncertain if they'd ever been tested before. So it really came up to almost one in three people had never been tested or reported they were uncertain. Uh, when it came to previous testing locations, a large number of them were coming from uh, public health clinics, uh, and this was actually also skewed as well, that it was more people who identified as males saying that they were going to specialty clinics where those who identified as females uh, were actually going through primary practice. And so it was just offering testing to two different groups in different ways. Uh, for uh, HIV status. Now I'll go to the next one for the actual results. So these are the first 399 uh, test results that we had just, our participants we had just within the Ottawa region. Uh, at present checking right before I logged on, we're up to something around 15 to 1600 uh, participants uh, within the last year. 
So of the results, the reporting rate comes in around two thirds now. Uh, we have, as you can see here, one positive result. This is up to four. And then yesterday we had two more reported in as well. So we have six positives reported to us uh, as new diagnoses who have been linked to care. Um, so it is like just exactly like what uh, we're stating. This is finding people. This is working uh, as we had expected. Uh, we are getting test kits into the hands right of people who actually need testing. So I think that this is uh, something that's reassuring uh, and also quite supportive right as we move forward uh, with all of this really helping us understand. Yes, self testing is what we want. Yes, multiplex testing is what we need. Um, here are new stat, uh, strategies, here are new ways to do it. Uh, how do we continue to evolve? How do we continue to adapt really to make sure that we get uh, these tests literally in the hands of the people that we want to have them? Uh, so the expansion, I also want to plug one thing that we've added in. We were approached uh, a few months back by the Ministry of Health to say you have an automated um, pseudo AI system, right, that actually will collect information, do risk assessments, screen people in and out. Uh, and so they approached us and said Health Canada is running pilots on molecular COVID self-tests. Could your project actually pivot um, to do the assessments and appropriately screen people in and out? Um, I, we said, sure, let's see how it goes. The answer was yes. And so now we have uh, actual molecular self-tests that people can order anywhere in Ontario. These just, I mean, everyone knows about self-tests and rapid tests for COVID. You really think of antigen-based tests just to get into the diagnostics of it. Um, these are molecular tests. There are three forms of molecular testing for COVID. Uh, there's PCR, there's NAT, and then there's LAMP. These are LAMP-based technologies. So what you think of for like the PanBio, the Abbott test that people can get that looks like a little sort of pregnancy test, if anyone's ever seen or done one before, those are antigen. Their sensitivity, so their ability to actually detect is probably around 60 to 70% perhaps a little bit higher in a controlled setting with somebody who is very good at doing the test. The molecular tests are actually uh, benchmarked in around 92 to 98 uh, percent. These are exceptionally accurate. They cost around $75 each, but they are free through Getikit. We have 8,000 for distribution across Ontario. Um, we also have through this cross-linked anyone who goes for a COVID test, uh, if appropriately, if appropriate, will be offered an HIV self-test and vice versa. So who would, for example, go through a COVID self-assessment and be offered an HIV self-test? This is going to be somebody who is, let's say a person who identifies as Indigenous. Um, they say that they do have fevers, uh, they have some chills, um, they are not a known contact of COVID. Uh, and when it gets to the end, we will say, in addition to the COVID test, an important, I mean, to put it into the medical terms, an important differential uh, diagnosis of the symptoms you're presenting with is HIV. COVID and HIV actually have very, very similar symptoms at presentation. And so we're building in to say, due to this, uh, we really want to sort of offer both tests to you and people can opt in or out uh, based on what they want. And we have actually had pretty good uptake uh, through the cross linkage expanding out and saying, right, this is what's bringing you in, but don't forget about these other tests. Why is this important? Clinically, I have seen probably within the last few months, six people for, for COVID testing, uh, and they were actually diagnosed with HIV. Fevers, chills, night sweats, um, difficulty breathing, sore throat, abdominal pain. We know these symptoms well from COVID. We've all filled out these self-assessments like infinite number of times over the last 18, 19 months. Uh, these are exactly the same uh, symptoms that you could have. Uh, as part of this, obviously, sort of retesting information uh, is given as well. Yes. So uh, my last slide is basically just the summary that says, what is it? Uh, automated online STI-HIV risk assessment algorithm uh, that screens in and out and also learns from this to adapt and become faster, targeted at the groups most affected uh, by all these different infections. Right, like a 16-year-old white teenage girl who has male partners and first sexual partner, I see clinically a lot. They come in and say, I want an HIV test. I'm like, you need a chlamydia test. And so the get kit system is actually um, sophisticated enough to have that level of resolution uh, and correct test recommendation. Uh, why? I don't need to belabor this point. We've gone through it. Um, the CASI works better. So CASI is the computer uh, assessment, simulated assessment. And there is excellent data showing that people actually answer more honestly when it's to a computer machine tablet uh, than to an actual person. No one wants to come in and tell me, like, well, why are you here? Well, I just I, I took a whole lot of meth and went to a gangbang in the bathhouse on the weekend. And so now I think I want testing. 
people are more apt to report that into a computer system um, than actually right saying it to my face. And then the goals, see what happens, right? We want to basically observe and do a prospective study and say, what happens? Is this useful? And I think both Rick and our data, the, the I'm ready uh, and the Getikid data support and show that this is something that we want, is useful, and we want to keep going with it. So I'm happy to be here, present, and really happy to be co-presenting with everyone around. And I think I went 45 seconds over. <laughs> That's OK, Patrick. Uh, thank you. Appreciated uh, your candor. Um, all right, last but not least, uh, we're going to turn things over to Chris uh, Dranos from the Community Based Research Center. Just a reminder for folks, uh, our participants, if you have questions as they come up for you, please drop them in the chat function and we'll get to those uh, in the order that they come in. Uh, Chris, over to you. Thanks. Thank you so much. And I did pull up my slide in advance. So uh, my name is Chris. I use even pronouns. I work at the Community Based Research Center, and I'm going to be presenting some preliminary results from the Test at Home program. Uh, to start with a land acknowledgement, as a national organization, the work of CBRC stands across the unceded ancestral and traditional territories of First Nations, Métis, and Inuit on land that is currently occupied in North Canada. We recognize and are grateful for living and working on these lands that have been cared for by Indigenous people since time immemorial. And I'm situated on the traditional territories of the Wendat, the Anishinaabek, the Anishone, Métis, and this is office of the Credit First Nation in what is commonly referred to as Toronto. As some acknowledgements, uh, first, uh, none of this work could be done without the community members who participated in this uh, survey uh, and the test at home program. And so I really wanted to thank them for their uh, time in uh, presenting this valuable uh, data to us. Um, as well, it takes a team. So we have a very large uh, research team and uh, we have our test now buddy for our peer support and a variety of community advisors who uh, input onto the recruitment, uh, development questionnaire and promotional materials. As well, we have a large number of community partners that support the promotion and recruitment of this work and we could not do this work without them as well as a variety of CBS research affiliates or academics uh, from across Turtle Island who uh, provide support for uh, all the CBS research work and Reach Nexus, which uh, provided funding and the HM self tests for this work. The Community-Based Research Center uh, promotes the health of gay men through research and intervention development. And we are inclusive of bisexual and queer men, both cis and trans and two spirit people. And our core pillars are community-led research, knowledge exchange, network building, and leadership development that position the organization as a thought leader, transforming ideas into action that make a difference for the So Chris, the, I'm very sorry to very sorry to interrupt. Uh, your audio is coming through just a little bit muffled. I'm wondering if your microphone is, is rubbing against something or perhaps you could take off your headphones. I just want to make sure everyone can hear your, your excellent content. Is that better? Yes, much better. Okay. Um, so the SexNow survey is uh, CBRC's principal community-based research initiative, uh, and it's the largest and longest running survey of GB22Q health in Canada, originating in Pride Festivals um, uh, across British Columbia in 2002. It's recently been administered both online and in-person at events across Canada in both official languages and recently in Spanish, Punjabi, and Chinese. Historically, it's been referred to as the gay census, and in, since 2018, we've expanded to include trans men, two-spirit, and non-binary people. And it's really an essential source of data on the health and well-being of GP22Q in Canada, and has been used uh, in a variety of different ways, including advocacy on blood donation and SOGI, such as sender, uh, sexual orientation and gender identity expression change efforts. This year we did the Sex Now survey uh, with the Test at Home edition as well. And Test at Home um, is a, a going to do collaboration with, uh, within support from Reach Nexus and was an optional sub study of the Sex Now survey. 
Recruitment opened in April of 2021 and ended in September 2021. Uh, and then uh, we will continue with uh, the follow-up for the test home program until February of next year. And so really the data I present is uh, still quite preliminary. Our research goals was to examine the uptake and acceptability of HIV self-testing and an HIV self-test program amongst uh, gay, bi, queer, trans, and two-spirit men and non-binary people nationally, and the feasibility of a male home HIV self-testing program and the social and sexual network distribution of HIV self-tests. Eligibility criteria included identity as a man or another gender other than a woman, inclusive of trans men, non-binary, and two-spirit people, and people uh, needed to identify either as gay, bi, queer, or non-heterosexual identity, or have had sex with a man in the past five years. Uh, provide informed consent, complete the questionnaire in French or English. Uh, we only offered this uh, in the official languages for the test home program. Uh, they need to be 18 years of older or, uh, and live in Canada. For the actual program, so as I mentioned, people entered through the SexNow survey, which collected demographic information and holistic data on health. And then they would opt in to test at home and receive up to three HIV self-test kits, which we mailed to an address of their choosing, uh, which they could use on themselves or distribute to their sexual social networks. We did include people living with HIV uh, within the test at home program as they could be community distributors, or maybe they wanted to try the HIV self-test on themselves. Um, after they received the tests, then they started to receive a series of surveys. Uh, so post-test, one month, three months, and six months. And throughout this process, we had the peer support of the test now buddies. So um, these are the test now buddies are community members who support folks taking HIV self tests, and they bring a diverse professional community personal experiences and received extensive training on HIV prevention and providing destigmatizing and affirming support. Um, they're available through a toll free number, um, which you can call or text uh, or an email as well. Uh, support is in English and French language, and they provide support for linkage to care, sexual health services, and other relevant services such as mental health or um, uh, other social terms of health like housing, food security, et cetera. Here's an example of some of the uh, 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 promotional materials that we used for this uh, program. Um, some of you may have seen it on uh, Scruff or Squirt. Uh, as well, we uh, had it on Pornhub, uh, Facebook, Instagram, uh, and uh, we also used uh, influencers as well. Uh, the HIV self-test kits came with a postcard encouraging folks to pass it on, and this was double-sided and bilingual. And the HIV self-test kits also included a sticker, uh, which had the contact information for our uh, test now buddies. And here's an example of some folks who posted on their Instagram uh, feed. Uh, some uh, they were received, receiving the HIV self test kit, um, and so this was uh, quite encouraging for us to see uh, folks do this uh, and really being really excited about uh, receiving uh, HIV self tests. So now I'll talk a bit about um, who participated in the study. Uh, and so this data is from uh, Sex Now, and so it's really looking at um, who of the Sex Now population participated in this program. So we had 2,272 participants enter the program, which represents about 38% of Sex Now participants who reached that point of the questionnaire. We distributed over 5,000 HIV self test kits uh, that were mailed out to folks, um, and more than 98% of the uh, shipments were received by our community members, and we've had 256 test kits uh, distributed into sexual and social networks, although 76% of people report an intention to distribute. And when we look at the number of people who were interested in the program, um, Ontario was about middle of the road, and we had a bit more 
um, interest in the Atlantic, particularly Nova Scotia, uh, where they do have uh, significant barriers to testing uh, there. Uh, and there was a little bit less uh, interest in Alberta. Um, so we really need to do a little bit more data on this. Um, Ontario was the um, largest percentage of uh, people who participated. And so it's about 850 from Ontario. When we look at who was interested by age, um, while the 31 to 59 group was actually the largest number of folks who participated, it was actually people who were 30 and under who were most interested. And we need to do some more analysis to understand whether this is related to the fact that uh, it could be related to social media use, it could be related to um, barriers accessing uh, testing through more traditional means. Um, but uh, it was great for us to see a uh, good uptake amongst the younger crowd. We look at gender identity. Um, people who were uh, uh, represented the diversity of uh, gender um, were more interested in the study than, uh, and so this was really great. And it also uh, potentially showed how there is there are barriers in uh, accessing testing amongst these groups. Um, and just as a note, agender is not the same as asexual. Um, so we do need to do a little bit more uh, analysis to understand that. Uh, we, when we looked at trans status specifically and two-spirit um, identity, uh, there actually wasn't any significant difference between people who chose to participate versus those who chose not to participate. And then when we look at um, sexual identity, uh, queer and pansexual folks, as well as uh, gay identifying men, uh, were most likely to be interested in participating. Uh, gay folks did represent the largest portion of people who participated in this study. Um, bisexual and straight, uh, there was less interest, and this might represent additional barriers to uh, participating in a program uh, that's uh, a bit more queer focused. Um, and bisexual, uh, men actually represent a large portion of the uh, participants. Uh, so again, something we need to do a little bit more, uh, look a little bit deeper into. Uh, one of the successes that we had was people that uh, identified as uh, people of color generally were much more interested, as we can see here, um, Southeast Asian folks, uh, almost two thirds uh, opted into uh, the program. Uh, whereas we had uh, actually, when we look at the right side of the column, uh, Black and African folks, um, while there was definitely still interest, um, it was uh, less than other people of color. Um, and so we need to work with our uh, community members to really understand this better. Um, we were actually anticipating a, a bit more uptake in suburban and rural areas. Uh, however, it was really the folks in the urban core and the urban areas uh, and remote as well who uh, participated in this study. Uh, and so um, I think that uh, there's a lot of opportunity for expansion within these areas where there are less resources. And it may just reflect the reach of who was uh, who was reached by the Sex Now survey. Um, so uh, I think that's another opportunity for us to think about. There was also a very clear trend when we looked at financial situation. And so those who had less resources uh, were actually less like, uh, more likely to be interested in participating. Uh, and so this was something that we were quite happy uh, with seeing. And I think one of the major differences uh, between this program and I'm Ready and Get a Kit is actually we had less uptake amongst folks who never tested. It was only about 10% of our sample. And this may just reflect the relative um, uh, 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 confidence that uh, people who participate in sex now have with accessing testing. Uh, and so there's, again, an opportunity for us to really look a little further into understanding who the folks who've never tested and whether they actually have indications for sexual health testing. And when we look at uh, clinical indications for HIV PrEP, so um, some of the main ones include um, gonorrhea, chlamydia, and the bum, uh, infectious syphilis, or injection uh, drug use. And uh, those who reported experiencing this um, actually were more likely to participate. 
Um, we do need to do a little bit more work to understand uh, some other aspects um, of, uh, so for example, uh, HERI score, uh, which um, is a tool that's used for uh, PrEP as well, there actually wasn't any difference amongst uh, folks who had uh, different HERI scores. So um, still more work to do on that. And now I'll just move on to the actual program itself and some of the experiences with HIV self-testing in our community. So we had 86% uh, of folks reported a very high satisfaction with the program and 92% found it easy to receive HIV self-test shipments by mail. Um, this is a quite a difference as we tried a um, private courier company with a pilot uh, prior to this um, and we had uh, quite a bit of difficulty. And so the move to Canada Post was actually um, quite good and a, quite a viable strategy for getting uh, HIV self-test kits mailed to folks. When people were asked about the benefits of the program, uh, convenience and privacy were really the main uh, aspects they liked the most. Um, only about 50% felt that the free aspect of the program was the, one of the main benefits. And a small minority uh, wanted uh, peer support. Um, so I think that this also shows the, um, as I'll speak it a bit, we had a bit less uptake of peer support similar to I'm Ready. When people were looking at the drawbacks of the program, um, the half of people identified no drawbacks, but then there's, we, there's a, definitely a small uh, percentage of folks who were worried about the result or concerned about whether it might be reliable or not. Uh, they were about the privacy of their information. And for some folks, testing through a nurse or a doctor are um, preferable. When we look at the actual peer support, um, we did find that there was high satisfaction with our test out buddies. Um, and also high satisfaction with the options that were available to contact them. So again, that's a toll-free number that people could call, text, or uh, there was also an email address. We had provided support to 174 participants, um, and about 75% of these interactions were initiated by the buddies. So we were proactively reaching out to folks to provide that peer support. And then once uh, people received the uh, text or email, um, then they would actually engage with the buddies themselves. Uh, and about 75% of these interactions were by text message and another 20% were by email. So people preferred um, that mode of communication over uh, phone uh, support. In terms of the uh, experience with the HIV self-test kit itself, 66% um, of participants found HIV self-testing somewhat or much better than standard testing, and another 20% found it uh, about the same uh, as uh, standard testing. 88% uh, of participants uh, told us that they were somewhat or very likely to use HIV self-testing again, and there was a uh, high acceptability in terms of ease of use and overall experience using the HIV self-test. When we were looking at the preferences for how people wanted to use self-test in the future. Uh, overwhelmingly, people wanted uh, to do it by themselves, um, with some people wanting in-person or virtual support with a slight preference for in-person uh, support as well. And in terms of where they would like the to be able to access HIV self-testing, and so uh, website was the preferred option. Um, this may be biased a bit by the fact that that's how they received the HIV self-test kit in the first place. Um, pharmacies and sexual health clinics were also uh, quite um, uh, popular. And as we go further down, some uh, some more innovative approaches, such as bathhouses, peers, or sexual partners. And this may also play out differently depending on the area. So you, uh, it is fairly Toronto centric, some of the data, um, or metro, metropolitan centric. Um, and so, you know, there are queer pharmacies. Uh, if that's not the case uh, in some other places, that might be less uh, interest of an option. Um, so I think we need to look at that a little bit closer. In terms of how people actually use the HIV self-test kit and supports that they used, um, so about two thirds of people read the package insert. Um, and this number increased over the course of the study as we were proactively encouraging people to read the package insert. 
And um, about 20% actually didn't use anything and just went for it. So I think that's really important for us to uh, remember um, that uh, you really need to think about uh, front loading the education um, as uh, there's often only like one touch point for the HIV self-test uh, when we're actually distributing it. And um, of note, uh, this happened during uh, a time when many uh, places were closed to in-person visits, so healthcare providers and community organizations really weren't utilized. Um, so whether that might change over um, uh, as things are slightly more open, uh, I think that uh, remains to be seen. And in terms of how people use the HIV self-test kit, um, so because we sent three uh, to folks, um, about 50% of the kits, um, the people that are reported to us haven't been used yet. Uh, and then 33% have been used for people to test themselves and 16% were given away to others. Um, we did have about a 30% invalid rate amongst those who reported results to us. And this may be a higher number, a higher percentage, uh, just due to the fact that uh, they may have had uh, wanted to tell us that it wasn't working or needed an additional HIV self-test kit. So um, I think that uh, as we look further, this number will change and we'll, we're quite interested to see what that will look like. We did identify um, one positive result uh, thus far, um, but we still have quite a ways to go uh, for that. And many folks have not told us the result. And so um, they may also just choose not to tell us uh, what the result is. So uh, that's something we may not ever know. In terms of the invalid results, we did a little bit of analysis on to what that, um, what might be uh, causing that. And really it was uh, not enough blood was what I get most identified as the cause. Um, and the no or a faint control dot, which really is actually not enough blood um, uh, in the, it, those are really the same things. Um, for some people, the lancet didn't work. And for some people, uh, they had spilled uh, liquid from the bottle. And we had, uh, as part, as we noticed early on, there were quite a few invalid results. Um, CBRC created a HIV self-testing campaign video with uh, Canadian model and uh, Canada Strad Race season one pit crew, Travis Lenaf. Um, so Travis is living with HIV and uh, he showed the HIV self-test kit and how to use it. Uh, and really focused on some areas that uh, would be less um, where people were not um, completing the self-test kit properly. Um, so I'm just going to actually show a quick video um, of the test kit, assuming I have about a minute or so. Sure thing. Thanks. Sir. <clears throat> when I was in sex ed, I remember them making it HIV was a gay thing, um, and that you probably would get it if you were gay. And a nurse would bring back my negative test. He'd be like, congratulations, or don't worry, you're HIV negative. So that when, every time you go for a test, they need to like preach out of this other result. And when I was positive, I mean, that was not the uh, response that I got. And this is an HIV at home self test kit available in Canada. How does it work? Let's find out. It's important for me to show my HIV test today because that is such a big moment. Sharing my positive test with people. There we go. Now it's time to put on the band aid. <laughs> Typically in media and at a doctor's office, we always aspire to a negative test result and grab a bottle number three. So it'll be interesting probably for people to want to see the two dots versus the one. I think I know what I'm gonna get. It's positive, HIV positive. After you test positive, you have some knowledge. So knowledge is power. And you can start to make some informed decisions at your own pace on how you want to tackle your new uh, HIV status. We're all part of the same community. So like, let's support our sisters in grieving our pause ones. One way that you can do that is learn a little bit more about it and fit the stigma yourself. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh... So I don't want to cut you off. Anything else uh, to wrap up? Uh, yes, just sure. 
we sorry. So um, really, we had uh, found good uptake uh, nationally um, and high acceptability amongst our population for this. Uh, and really, the feasibility of a bail home HIV self-test program, um, I think, is uh, there. Uh, we just need to do a bit more work on reducing the invalid results. Some additional work that we're going to be doing. Uh, there's a medicine bundle pilot for two-spirit Indigenous communities in BC that we'll be holding. Um, we're also launching a community-based organization distribution project, um, which is happening in the prairies, Atlantic, and BC. And we hope to see folks at Pride Festivals next year um, and do another HIV self-test study uh, there. Um, and so thank you very much, everyone. Thanks so much, uh, Chris, Rick, and Patrick. Uh, this was really wonderful. I mean, there's a lot of um, good news stories, I think, in uh, what we're hearing in terms of who's being reached, uh, reaching the undiagnosed, and providing uh, options for folks that they prefer. Um, let's just take a look at the chat here. I saw uh, there was some back and forth around uh, the COVID self-test. I think, thanks, Patrick, for responding there. Uh, Randy, will the INSPI self-test give a reactive response when an individual is undetectable or has a suppressed viral load? Um, Thanks. Go ahead. Does that open up anybody, uh, uh, Dane? Sure, yeah, but I imagine uh, uh, given your experience with the INSPI test, uh, you can uh, take it away, thank you. Sure, yeah. So um, the INSPI test, because it detects antibodies, uh, is usually not impacted with an individual's viral load. So if someone isn't undetectable, uh, for the most part, they would still have detectable antibody because it's an entirely different marker. Now, that being said, um, you know, long-term folks who uh, have, have been living with HIV may uh, over time lose detectable antibodies for uh, a test like INSTI. And at that point it can be, you know, it can become negative. However, INSTI is, uh, it, it's important to remember that that test, it, its intended use is for the initial testing as a screen test. Once a person tests positive, there's really no need to retest again with the INSTI test. You, you move into the uh, monitoring phase, which does not include monitoring for antibodies. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Rick. And Randy, I see uh, your hand up. Please go ahead. Yeah, the, the reason why I asked the question um, was after watching um, the, the video that Travis did, um, I was curious because I have had a few folks come in to do point of care testing with the, with me at the ASO where I work and have been nervous about the, the procedure. Um, so I have on more than one occasion volunteered to do a test on myself just to show how, how easy it is if a self test is something they would prefer to get through um, the programs that we're involved with, I'm ready and, and get a kit. And every INSTI test that I've done on myself has been non-reactive. And so when I saw Travis um, do it on, on the video, I'm like, am I a fake? Am I a fraud? Have I been living HIV free for the last six years? And uh, I, I realized that's not the case, but I, I just, uh, I, I knew I was expecting to get a reactive result, but each time I've done the test and I've done three on myself now, they've all come back as non-reactive. So that's why I was just curious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it is... Uh... In definitely very much um, individual person based, uh, you know, the antibodies that are being detected by INSTE, there's usually a very high sensitivity to even picking up low levels, but that doesn't mean that over, you know, over a long term, especially, you know, you know individuals who are being treated, uh, you know, those antibodies can, can really disappear when, when the virus is really no longer present in large amounts in the individual person. Uh, you know, the need to produce antibody is diminished over time. And, and so uh, it's one of the reasons why the test is not routinely used in, you know, individuals living with HIV once they've been diagnosed because of that very, you know, that very uh, real possibility of what's called zero reversion, moving from uh, a positive result that may have happened earlier in the infection to a negative result does not mean you're, you're no longer living with HIV, as you, as you rightly said. Um, it's just other markers would, would need to be uh, 
um, you know, continued uh, that look for the virus itself. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's what I thought. I just brought it up as a point of interest. Yeah. No, it's a good point because a lot of people see that and they jump to the wrong conclusion. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. I see some, uh, there was some uh, discussion there around the use of the COVID test via get a kit for travel. Thank you, Patrick, for uh, confirming that Canada Border Services will not accept it. Uh, any other questions from our participants? You can either drop it in the chat or uh, raise your hand and uh, we'll call on you to unmute yourself. While we wait for those to come in, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm really struck by, I feel like there was a consistent theme throughout uh, these presentations, and that's in regards to the low uptake of peer navigators and peer support. So one of the thoughts I had was, you know, is this um, a success story in that we have uh, alliance members, educators, folks working in organizations who are, you know, sharing messages about the realities of HIV today, uh, U equals U, et cetera. Um, and I, I just wonder just for, for anyone uh, to offer their reflection on that low uptake uh, of peer navigators and what might be at play. I can go. Um, I think it represents, uh, at least in the queer male community, um, Many folks have a lot of experience with HIV testing. Um, many of us have um, had a point of care test done on us many times. Um, and so I think that there is, people liked the idea maybe of it being available um, and less so liked actually the uptake of it. Uh, as we saw in the test home program, most folks just wanted to do the test by themselves and not involve anyone else. Um, and so I think that also we, um, you know, I think we also can be a little bit paternalistic in the HIV like service community. And we often think everyone needs additional support. And while certain folks do, there are some people that don't actually need that. And so uh, it may just be a little bit of um, our uh, approaches to how we're providing care as well too. Absolutely. Thanks for that, uh, Chris. Also, um, Adrian suggesting that perhaps COVID uh, may play a role here as well. Um, question from Michael Brennan uh, in Windsor. Uh, any demographic data on participants that used peer navigators? Um, were certain populations more likely to use them than others, perhaps? Yeah, maybe I can just uh, jump in. Um, unfortunately, we haven't compiled all that data yet. That's something that we're certainly looking into, you know, given the, the, the really low uptake, at least in the I'm Ready program, it's, it's really hard to draw any conclusions around trends, you know, related to demographics, uh, geography, um, you know, things like that. Uh, but obviously it's something that would be interesting to know. Um, you know, we do know, for example, that the, appointments that have been made, even though limited in number, have kind of covered the spectrum from individuals who wanted help with self-testing while they're doing the test, uh, or in, in many cases, it was uh, after they did the test for information on linkage to uh, care pathways or uh, other prevention services, and, um, and even covering sort of pre-test questions, people just generally curious and wanted some information about the self-test. So this is kind of covering the spectrum of the peer navigator services, just in not in the numbers that we had expected. We honestly, maybe somewhat naively expected that there would be a lot of interest um, in you know, accessing peer navigators uh, who are all people with lived experiences, um, well-advertised, well-featured, you know, in the program, uh, and just not, uh, you know, not not access to anywhere near the degree we thought. So obviously, you know, we need to look at this and see what are those, um, possibly what some of those barriers are. And even the peers themselves are going to help out in that regard. You know, they, they have uh, their own thoughts, and uh, so which we value. 
absolutely. Um, uh, Rick, you had mentioned that uh, the Oroquic HIV self-test used now for many years in the U.S. Uh, is on its way to Canada by the sounds of it. Mm -hmm. um, will that have an impact on cost of HIV self-test for those folks who are, are purchasing them? At last check for the current INC test, one kit uh, delivered to my place was $52.05. Are we going to see the price come down? Well, you certainly hope so. I think that's one of the goals. I mean, not only, you know, having a second self-test available in the Canadian marketplace will, will give individuals choice, uh, choice by uh, maybe a preference for an oral fluid test as opposed to a blood-based test, for example. Uh, some people resonate better with oral fluid, and that's been shown uh, across the world in, you know, in many different settings. Um, and others may still maintain a preference for blood-based testing. But certainly, uh, just through the laws of economics, you would expect when there's competition, uh, you know, with self-test devices that we'll see a, a decrease in prices. So I think that's going to be a desirable outcome, uh, for sure, uh, as to what and where they end up, it, it's all about, you know, demand and, and market demand. So, uh, but we're optimistic that we'll see a lower price. Maybe just Thank to you. interject really quickly, I would love to see governments uh, uptake the HIV self-test and offer it to free, for free to people. Uh, you know, you can get a lab-based HIV test, which is quite expensive um, to do uh, to the healthcare system. And so thinking about HIV self-test as an option to, uh, for folks to be able to have better access. Absolutely, thank you so much. Uh, just quickly, we have a, a couple minutes left and we wanna to get to all of these. Thank you, Dane in um, Peterborough for your comment regarding um, challenges in the rural suburban space. Question from uh, Brian Lester in London. Have peer navigators shared their experiences? Any insights to help with uptake? I, I don't know, Chris, if, if your um, um, you know, test buddies have, have, have shared that. I know with, with our program, uh, we're about to start uh, working with our peers, sort of in, in focus groups to share their experiences, but we haven't compiled that yet. Um, I don't know, Chris, on your side. I think that um, we're looking at how we can more proactively reach out to folks, um, but we also are cognizant that I think the message we've heard so far from our participants is that they are less interested in talking with someone about their HIV self-testing and want to kind of do it on their own. So we're looking at ways for people that are wanting to engage and how do we support those folks in accessing prevention services um, and retesting as well. Thank you. Uh, and finally, uh, just to wrap, question from Colin Johnson. I think, uh, I don't want to speak on your behalf, but I think I can answer this, that the peer navigators are from uh, various communities and represent um, all the sort of intersections of folks who are impacted by HIV across the country, including uh, African Caribbean and Black communities uh, and Indigenous communities. Definitely. All right, well, um, I want to thank Rick, Patrick, Chris for taking the time to join us uh, this morning. There was um, just a lot of really rich uh, content. Uh, and good news coming out of um, all three of these projects. Um, it's, I think, lunchtime likely for a lot of folks. We hope to see as many of you uh, as available at one o'clock, where we're going to hear from the front lines of our Alliance members and organizations across Ontario who are implementing uh, the various projects that we uh, have heard from this morning. Uh, and a particular interest uh, we'll hear from Two-Spirited People of the First Nations, as well as Black Cap on their work making HIV self-testing available in their communities. 